So we're going to get, uh, get going because we've got a packed and hopefully very interesting and enlightening hour and a half to come. So I think it's fair to say that uh, back in April when Anita Charlesworth from the Health Foundation and I started debating whether we ought to have a debate about whether we needed a hypothecated tax to fund the NHS, our big piece of risk management was that the government would not only announce the amount it was going to give to the NHS, but it might also announce how it proposed to pay for that amount. Um, so I've been very worried. Theresa May went on the Mars show and said, I'm going to make a big announcement about NHS funding at the NHS's 70th birthday. And I thought, well, she's got to say how they're going to pay for it. So I emailed Anita and said, do we need to bring this forward? Panic, panic, panic. Um, fortunately, the government uh, ducked the difficult question by announcing the good news. If, uh, if you think £20 billion for the NHS is good news, it announced the good news and has passed a very big parcel straight to the Chancellor to say, and you tell us how we're going to pay for it. So fortunately, this issue is still live. Uh, so we're absolutely delighted to be joined this evening by a uh, stellar lineup of people representing the sort of different interests at play in this. We have uh, economists who've also got extensive experience of public administration in the shape of Lord McPherson, Nick McPherson, known to many of you, and indeed I think many of you have worked for him in your time, and he's also worked for me. Anyway, no. <laughs> so well. uh, anyway, former permanent secretary of the Treasury. We have Damon Shafiq, uh, who has sort of done the rounds of international organisations, been Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, a permanent secretary of the Department for International Development, is now Director of the LSE. They're bringing the economist -y perspective to it, economists and administration. We then have uh, Dr. Claire Gerarda, uh, former head of the Royal College of General Practitioners here, very well known as a very sort of fervent advocate on behalf of the NHS, it's proper funding. And Mark Pearson, who's been in charge of health policy at the OECD and is now director of employment social programs. Uh, they're gonna bring a health perspective to this and uh, potentially also a bit of international comparative. Wait to see. No pre-planning here. <laughs> and then we thought the absolutely critical bit of this is actually, at the end of the day, this comes down to a lot of the raw politics. So we have Nick Bowles, MP. Uh, Nick, before Nick became known for being uh, Mr. Better Brexit, Nick was known <laughs> for being Mr. Hypothecated Tax for the NHS. And actually, before Nick was Mr. Hypothecated Tax for the NHS, Nick was uh, Mr. Apprenticeship Levy, a good idea to test out hypothecated taxes. And Nick's got a consistent track record <laughs> of advocating hypothecated taxes. And against him, we have Roshanara Ali, uh, Labour MP for Bowen Bethnal, former member, member of the Treasury Select Committee. Current currently on the Treasury Select Committee. So uh, the people who last week got a letter from Philip Hammond talking about the impacts on public finances <coughs> of Brexit. So it's an absolutely fantastic lineup. Just a bit of context about why we're doing this. We're absolutely delighted to be doing this in partnership with the Health Foundation, Jennifer Dixon, Chief Executive, the audience, and Anita Charles with their Chief Economist. Um, we, in our report, uh, published now, almost over two years ago, I think, called Better Budget, said we actually need a better public debate, pu better public conversation about tax. So we think this is part of contributing to that. Uh, we're very pleased to partner with the Institute for Fiscal Studies and Charges and Taxation on that report. But I think one of the big themes that the Institute is also interested in looking forward at is actually, you know, with demands on public services, pressure on this, of which the sort of first bit out of the toothpaste tube is the NHS and social care coming along behind, but potentially as we move forward, a lot of other big demands for better public services and increasing concern about the tax base, actually, how do we get into a position where we can, be, as a country, have both the spending we want and think we need, but also raise enough taxes to pay for it in a respectable way, and that's going to be a future theme of some work at the IFG. So any ideas on that, please contact me or our director, Bronwyn Maddox, in the front row. So what we're going to do is each of these speakers are primed to go. Uh, they will talk for no more than seven minutes. Tim in the front row is going to be very strict on time control. They're going to do it. We're going to do a sort of ping pong game between all of them. Then you're going to have a chance to ask them questions. Uh, probe them. We might get them to answer questions of each other as well a bit. Uh, 
Then we're going to get you to vote. Uh, so be ready, see who you're convinced by, who you're not so convinced by. Uh, we'll get you to vote. And then Anita Charlesworth is going to uh, summarise the debate uh, and we're going to try and add up the votes and then we'll announce the result and then we'll all adjourn for a drink. Uh, so anyway, so that's how we're going to run the day. And without further ado, I'm going to get off the stage and make way for Lord McPherson. Jill, thank you hugely. Um, look, tonight I want to make a, the pragmatic case for a pragmatic form of hypothecation. We've got to face up to reality. The government has lost the will to reduce public spending. June's announcement of more health spending without any indication of how it would be paid for is indicative. And um, less the opposition is going to come to our aid, uh, they're committed to spending even more. Um, this year's public finance data has been encouraging, but we should be under no illusions. Even now we're not running a surplus, but we're nine years into a recovery and this is probably as good as it gets. Brexit, when it comes, um, is, gonna, is likely to reduce taxable capacity further. Um, but more importantly, and it's good to see my old friend uh, Robert Choate at the end of the room, more importantly, the demographic pressures uh, long predicted have finally arrived. According to the Independent Office for Budgetary Responsibility, <laughs> spending on health and social care is set to rise by 1.4% of GDP in the, next five, in the next 10 years. That's about 28 billion. But it gets worse still. Um, in the following decade, it's set to rise by 1.8% of national income, which is, in current terms, 36 billion pounds. So higher taxes are inevitable. Uh, the only question is how to do it. Now, successive governments have found it remarkably difficult to make taxes stick. Only twice in the last 66 years have taxes national in and national insurance risen above 34% uh, of national income. So that means that we're currently at 33.9%. My guess is it's going to be very difficult to get much above that. And British voters, despite what they say to opinion pollsters, are in the ballot box understandably reluctant to vote for higher taxes. Even if they want more spent on public services, they simply don't trust the government to spend it on the services which they value. But, and this is the interesting thing, they are hugely attached to a socialist nationalist health, national health service free at the point of use. They worry about long-term care, and for some bizarre reason, they have supported the so-called triple lock for the uprating of the state pension in successive elections. And I would argue the only way to square this circle is through hypothecation. I recognize it's anathema to the IFS, uh, to refugees from the IFS, like Mr. Giles. <laughs> Um, I recognise it's anathema to the Treasury, but what I would say is um, that there is really no alternative other than borrowing, and that is even worse. Now, um, to purists who want efficient public finances, um, hypothecation imposes an arbitrary constraint. Since revenues are generally cyclical, there's a risk that the hypothecated service will be awash with resources in a good time and totally starved of them in a bad time. Critics point to the experience of the road fund between the war, when just when you needed to spend money on roads in the 1930s, um, the cupboard was bare, so um, the government got rid of it. And um, look, I'm about as orthodox um, when it comes to treasury orthodoxy as, as it comes. You don't, you don't work at the treasury for 31 years without <laughs> imbibing the true milk of Gladstonian orthodoxy. And I totally recognise that under normal circumstances, you want to maximise flexibility and discretion and have a consolidated fund, the fund um, created by, not created by Gladstone, but certainly um, embedded by Gladstone to maximise discretion. But history suggests that taxpayers don't subscribe to treasury orthodoxy. It's, it's very disappointing. And national insurance is a good case in point. For much 
of um, the post-war period, people paid a flat rate stamp in exchange for, at some point down the line, getting a flat rate pension. Barbara Castle changed it to income-related um, national insurance contributions to income-related benefits. Governments then, realized, realizing that um, taxpayers were irrational in liking national insurance, not only cut back all the benefits, but they actually raised national insurance while cutting income tax. Nevertheless, there is a lesson here. And when I think of pragmatic um, hypothecation, I think of soft hypothecation, and I think of Gordon Brown's seminal um, wanless report, the great debate on health spending in the early 2000s, and um, a rise in national insurance both for employers and employees. This is about the only example I can remember of a discretionary tax increase which, which was genuinely popular. And I think in striking an increase in spending to a specific tax, he struck a chord with the electorate. And um, the lesson of Brown's um, national insurance hike, rather like um, the point Jill was referring to earlier about the IFG report, is if taxpayers feel involved in a discussion and debate, um, they um, are more likely to own the outcome. So my preferred solution, which I've tried out before, is an NHS tax linked to the, NH to the electoral cycle. Now, in, in my vision, we would rely on an extended, beefed-up IFS to cost um, to set out the baseline increase in um, health spending over the next five years ahead of an election. It would then be open to politicians and political parties to set out their proposals. If they wanted to spend more than the baseline, um, a special NHS tax would be set to deliver the increase in spending. Um, if they wanted to reduce spending, obviously they could reduce the NHS tax, which may be, under certain circumstances, popular. The tax would be incremental. Um, the rate would not need to be high. I'm not a, someone who thinks you should spend all £150 billion pounds of the NHS in, in the UK from a, a sim, single tax. This is, this is a pragmatic approach. Now, I have special views on the form of that tax. To preserve intergenerational fairness, the old um, should pay it as well as employees. Um, and um, it should be pay, payable on savings, rental, and pensions income as well as earnings. Um, I've been told I've run out of time. So um, link it to the electoral recycle, rely on the IFS, reconnect voters with the NHS, and um, we can ensure that um, spending is financed from tax rather than um, the appalling uh, approach at present of financing current spending out of borrowing. The one lesson I learnt in my um, 11 years as Permanent Secretary of the Treasury is you cannot be too fastidious about tax. You have to get it where you can. Thank you. <laughs>Pleasure pleasure to be here uh, debating with Nick, and I, I appreciated that pandering to the IFS refugees by saying you can be in control of this tax, but um, <laughs> I, uh, I am from the London School of Economics and Political Science, so I am going to start with the economics and then I'm going to talk about the political science. Every public finance textbook, starting with the oldest one I could find in 1895, has argued that hypothecated tax is a bad idea. And I won't rehearse all the arguments in detail, but they are broadly the following. First, uh, revenues should be raised in a way that minimizes distortions to deliver maximum public goods, and therefore general taxation is generally less distortionary. Second, public spending should be based on policy, not on the random level of revenue that you happen to raise from a particular tax. Third, uh, fiscal flexibility is a good thing and hypothecated taxes introduce rigidity into the budget process. And finally, as, as Nick alluded to, hypothecated taxes can thwart the automatic stabilizers we have in budgets, which are a good thing because otherwise you may get lots of revenue when you need it the least uh, and when you really need it in the midst of a recession, you won't have it there. Now, 
Like Brexit, hypothecation comes in a hard variety and a soft variety. <laughs> the hard variety uh, means that public services are exclusively financed by the revenues generated by the hypothecated tax. And like hard Brexit, it is economically mad. <laughs> the soft variety uh, means that it's a supplemental tax, a bit like what Nick has suggested, which is that it is additive uh, and only partially funds the public service in question. And like soft Brexit, it is a second best solution. It is clearly not the first best, and I would argue the economics of this is patently clear. So let's turn to the politics. Uh, and here, really, the alleged benefits of a hypothecated tax are really about the politics. People argue that having a transparent link between a tax and a public service means that you have clarity and transparency and much greater accountability. It also means that you're more likely to generate public support for that particular tax. Now, I can think of a lot better ways to deliver transparency and accountability in public finances. So it really, really the argument boils down to public support. Will you be able to generate political consensus for higher taxation with hypothecation? And I guess here, I, I, I can't help but recall Lincoln's argument in a famous debate in 1858, where he allegedly said, you can fool all of the people some of the time, and some of the people all of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. And I think hypothecation is precisely that. It is a great deception. It, uh, you know, the example of national insurance in the UK is a good one. National insurance was initially put in place to fund the welfare state. Welfare spending very quickly grew to much higher levels than national insurance generated. And then Gordon Brown, uh, in 2002, added an increment to national insurance to fund the NHS. Uh, and in, in practice, spending very quickly outstripped those needs. Uh, for example, in 2007, 2008, <coughs> national insurance generated 100 billion. We spent 102 billion on the NHS that year. But three years later, in the midst of the financial crisis, national insurance only raised 96 billion, while we were spending 121 billion on the NHS. So strong hypothecation would have been a very bad idea, but even soft hypothecation would have been inadequate. Now let me just say, I'm not ideologically opposed to hypothecation in some cases where it makes sense. So I used to work at the World Bank. We build hundreds of thousands of miles and kilometers of roads in developing countries, often found that after building the roads, the governments didn't budget for maintenance and those road investments were wasted because they were never maintained. And so we started all around the world to, when we built a road, we instituted a road tax alongside it, which would generate revenues to fund maintenance. And the road tax was sort of attractive because it was linked to the cost, the, the cost driver. So the more people use the roads, you would generate more revenues because you'd need more maintenance. And there was an alignment between what was driving cost, what was driving spending increases and what the actual tax was taxing. And so I asked myself, what would be the equivalent in the health sector? How, what are the big cost drivers and what would you need to tax to match those cost drivers? Well, if you look at the roughly 4% increase in NHS spending that we see each year, only about 1% of that is driven by aging. About 1.5% is being driven by rising costs associated with new health technologies. And about 1.5% is associated with increased demand for health care. Because as people's incomes rise, health is a sort of a luxury good, and you demand better health care. So what would we tax? Option one is to tax aging, politically problematic, I would say. Number two would be to tax improved health technologies. Again, not an obvious place you would want to go. And then finally, you would want to tax something that is linked to demand for health care, which looks like an income tax. Or you could tax things that increase demand for healthcare, like bads, like sugar, like alcohol, like cigarettes, which we do and probably could do more of. So you end up looking at general taxation. Now, so my, so my view would be an honest conversation is preferable. Everyone knows taxes have to go up. 
public opinion has shifted. The last 2017 British Social Attitude Survey showed that 61% support a rise in taxes to fund the NHS. UK tax to GDP is actually relatively low. If you compare us to the G7 and to European countries, we are, if you increase NHS spending uh, by about, say, 3% of GDP, if you increase public spending by 3% of GDP, which is at the very high end, uh, we would be spending as much as Canada, which is hardly a socialist republic. And I, the one area I do very much agree with Nick is I think the elderly should pay a greater share of the costs. They are the biggest driver of rising costs in the NHS. And if you look at what's happened to income distribution over the last decade, it has favored the elderly uh, since they have been relatively fiscally protected. So I would look at wealth taxes, inheritance taxes, and things like linking retirement ages to life expectancy. So people have to work longer when they're older to generate that income. The elderly, the fact that the elderly vote is a bit of a problem, and I think the politicians <laughs> will highlight this, but I would also argue they have a stake in this because they're the biggest users of the NHS, and I think there is a case that can be made. So my bottom line, the economics is clear, the politics is dodgy, an honest conversation with the elderly is what we need. Thank you. And I'm sad to say that next year I join those ranks of the elderly. So I think we've got to be very careful. Uh, and I will pick up the elderly issue. But actually, I will, first of all, by start, which is where I wasn't going to start, by saying it isn't the elderly that are the biggest users of healthcare. It is actually the obese that are the biggest use of healthcare, because diabetes actually accounts for about 10% of all our NHS spends. So I think we've got to be very careful. Uh, and, and health costs are actually related to, to inequalities as well. But we'll pick that issue up at the moment. But you know, I was thinking, gosh, sad how it catches up on you. So uh, I was wondering when I was invited here, why I was invited. And then I saw the, the invite, and it actually had me down as Dr. Claire Gerarda, uh, the uh, former permanent secretary to the Treasury. So. <laughs> I thought, I know it's my, my, my knowledge of economics, which actually, sadly, I have no knowledge of economics, despite being a GP. I, my, my knowledge extends to knowing the difference between gross and net, and that, actually, sometimes I forget. Uh, I also know virtually, or knew virtually nothing about hypothecation, but I'll, I do certainly now. I think I was invited for two main reasons. One, I sat on an independent group that was commissioned by the Liberal Party, uh, and that group had uh, uh, many experts, and myself wasn't an expert on hypothecation, but certainly an expert on, on healthcare. And we recommended at the end of that review that hypothecation, for all sorts of reasons that you're hearing now, was the best way forward. But I think the reason I was invited is because I'm a doctor. I'm a GP, and I probably have worked in the NHS longer than certainly anybody on this panel, if not anybody in the audience. And I started working in the NHS as a 14-year-old, so many moons ago, uh, working then as a, as, as a receptionist in my father's single-handed GP practice. I then got promoted and worked in a in a local pharmacist where we spent the whole day, and this was the early 70s, giving out Valium to, to women, because that was all that women got in those days. And now I'm, a, 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 I'm now a, a general practitioner and have been a GP across the river in South London for the best part of 26 years, having first trained as a psychiatrist. So I know the NHS in and out. I, I've lived and breathed it. It's, it's been part of my, my inner sense. And therefore, I come to you with a, a real sense of, of what I feel and why I think we need hypothecation. Like many of you who have worked in the NHS, we're just about fed up of going from feast to famine, mainly to famine. Uh, I'm fed up, I probably had about six or seven reorganisations in my career, but I'm fed up of having the, the famine states where my patients uh, will have to wait three years for a hip replacement, which wasn't that long ago. And to wait three years when you're in pain and can't climb the stairs is really bad. It isn't as bad as that. Now we now have a, a two-week wait process for, for cancer treatment that really and truly will see you in two weeks or under two weeks. But as a GP, I, I am in trepidation for, for where 
the, 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 the funding cycle is. And I, like many of my colleagues, we, we appropriately or uh, inappropriately then ration healthcare by reducing referrals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have learned over the years to ration it. And actually, uh, what we really want and what you've been hearing is some sort of stability in our funding. You've heard about the funding crisis that we face, £30 billion by 2020, I think. You've also heard for some of the reasons why this is. And I put it down to I fundamentally blame clever people. <laughs> Absolutely fundamentally. If you take clever scientists and get them to do some clever things, they will create clever ways of keeping us alive. And that is fundamentally what's happened. Increase in technology costs. Though, as some of you know I was chair of the Royal College of GPs many, about five years ago, and I looked at my predecessor, the last female chair, who wrote a seminal piece of work at about 1956, 1957. And at the time she said, the real problem about the NHS is rising technology, ageing population and increasing expectations. So that was in the mid-50s. So nothing has changed. <laughs> so if you have clever people creating clever ways of keeping people alive, they will stay alive. When, <laughs> when I started work as a GP, uh, sort of when I you, you got ill, you got better or you died. There, there was no other option. <laughs> and that was what happened. And now, of course, you get ill, we give you all sorts of treatments, you improve, you develop chronic long-term diseases, and in fact, the, the, the long-term morbidities, the long-term diabetes, hypertension, are the real rise, which the elders can, of course, the more elderly patients, people you have, the more the cost, but as you've said quite <laughs> rightly, the elderly population are also staying healthier longer. I did mention diabetes. Diabetes is 10% of all NHS spend, and type 2 diabetes, the biggest cause of type 2 diabetes, which is a reversible disease, ladies and gentlemen, a reversible disease, is obesity. So if you're starting to look at how we can start to, to, to make savings in the NHS, or at least create revenue for the NHS, that gives you a hint too. I know somebody's going to mention the fact that the NHS doesn't need any more money. Well, because, as I said of those clever people, it certainly does need money. But the one way of reducing the money that we need on the NHS is to have more of me, GPs. And if we're going to hypothecate taxation at all, then hypothecate it to create more GPs and we'll have a hypothecate. <laughs> we keep the NHS safe, we keep the NHS affordable, and countries, including China, where I've recently come back from, uh, are trying to, they're trying to create uh, half a million GPs. You think Jeremy Hunt had it hard wanting to get 5,000, but <laughs> hey ho. Well, you've heard the arguments for hypothecation, accountability, trust. People tend to trust doctors and healthcare staff. That's slightly reducing at the moment, but they tend to over politicians. Also, there's some sort of accountability, and also the public will be able to see where there's money going from. I'm not an expert in taxation, but having been on the Lib Dem uh, committee and looking at some of the things, and having seen that my uh, big birthday is happening next year, so if any of you want to give me some presents, that's fine. But what will happen on my 60th, 60th birthday is I will earn more because I will not pay uh, my national insurance contributions, or in fact they'll drop. I will, so I'll earn more, I will pay less because I get free prescriptions, but I will use the health care more because, of course, as you get older. So it seems paradoxical that somebody that's still in full-time employment will be paying less taxation than my children who are in their mid-twenties. So ladies and gentlemen and politicians, if you want to earn more, if you want to raise more money, then please, as we've heard, my generation owe oh, it to the, the generation coming up behind me to pay more tax and our fair share if we're continuing to be economically active. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The IFG is the only place you can where you hear people voluntarily offering to pay loads more tax. So, <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome Mark Pearson over from Paris. So, Mark. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I should immediately, in the spirit of admitting embarrassing facts, say that I'm an also a refugee from the IFS. <laughs> this is going back a, a long time, isn't it, Paul? I mean, we're going back now to 92. Occasionally, Paul allows me back in the country as long as I don't talk about anything to do with tax. Because, in fact, I didn't really work on tax when I was at the IFS. What I have been covering for the past uh, many years at the OECD is health. Uh, comparing health systems across developed countries. And I have three points, really, to make. 
on this topic of hypothecation based on that work. The first is going to be that it doesn't work. This is not a new idea. It's not an idea that's not been tried in other countries. It has been tried in other countries. I don't know what outcomes you're expecting to get from hypothecation. I don't see them. Um, second issue I'm going to briefly touch on is what's so special about health, really? There are good reasons for thinking that we want to be prioritizing lots of other areas of spending as well. And the third issue I want to just touch on is whether we really think that hypothecation is consistent with what we actually want to do with the, with the health system. Is it actually helping or hindering how we need to transform our health systems in the future? So I'm going to focus really a little bit more on the first one, probably because I'm the international guy, so I suppose I'm expected to say a little bit about the international experience. If it were such a good idea, those countries that have tried it surely would be much more enthusiastic about hypothecation than they actually are. Or even, maybe you would actually expect to see that they spend more money on health than, they, than countries without hypothecation. Neither is true. The countries that have had hypothecated taxes for many years, pretty much all of them have been moving gradually away. The hypothecation has been getting less and less. Before 1997, you could say France had an entirely hypothecated system for taxation. Since then, no. And it's been getting less and less. They rely more and more on the public funding. Japan, Slovenia, do you want me to mention more countries? It's just not been the way that countries that have got hypothecation have been continuing with it. There are exceptions that get a lot of noise and maybe distract people from the evidence. Sin taxes, taxes on tobacco, taxes on alcohol, more recently taxes on soda, they are becoming much more popular and they are generally hypothecated. I did a quick calculation. I found 30 countries which are hypothecating tobacco taxes, about 10 are on alcohol taxes and another 10 on other sorts of sin taxes. But we're talking tiny amounts of money. We're not talking about financing the health service through those taxes on, on sin. Uh, Poland, I think I calculated, it's 0.001% of their uh, tax revenues are coming from sin taxes. So sure, they're there in the list of hypothecated uh, taxes, but they're not really doing anything with it. Philippines is an exception if you really want to look for a country. If you want to really follow the Philippines example, well, be my guest. Where it is big, you do sometimes see big numbers. I mean, Italy, I think they're up to, what, 34.8% of VAT is supposedly hypothecated for the health service. It's a made-up number. It's just a number. Um, it doesn't cover all the, the health spending. It's just a number that they say each year, oh, yes, 34.8% this year. It's the softest of soft hypothecation. It's a number that they hope will help people pay the taxes. It's not really hypothecation in any sense, nobody takes it terribly seriously. Is that really what we're after? And one other example, what, one serious attempt, the best attempt at hypothecation, I think, recently, was Estonia, where they said 13% national insurance type system contributions to the health service. 13% isn't enough for the UK system, paid for by the employers. It was for the Estonian health system. They weren't actually spending anywhere near as enough um, on their health system. But they, that meant that they could actually build up a surplus. And they did that deliberately because they knew that when a recession came, they wouldn't have um, as many revenues from the 13% employer revenue. So they had a fund that they were going to use to cover their costs when the recession came. And the recession did come in 2008-9. And, of course, what happened was that the government used the money to bail out the rest of the banking system. I mean, it doesn't work. Why would you actually, if there's a chunk of money there, it's sitting there ready for the government to use, what's to stop them ever using it for, for anything else other than health? So I don't think empirically there is any real evidence that actually hypothecation has ever actually worked. And as if, if you want the, the details on spending, I could go into the spending, but there's no evidence that it leads to higher spending on health either. Second issue is really why are we prioritizing health? What's so special about the health system that that's the area that we target hypothecation? 
I absolutely agree. There's many reasons why we should be spending more on health. There's an extremely strong case to spend more, for example, on our mental health system, not just in the UK, but more generally. I could go through a whole area, range of other areas in the health system where there's a very good case for spending more. But is it really better, even for actual health outcomes, than spending more, say, on tackling very poor childhood outcomes for the, the real tail of the distribution, where we know we have very, very bad outcomes? Um, and in the UK, surely social care, I mean, if we're being objective, really, one minute already? <laughs> if we're really being objective, is, isn't social care at the moment a bigger priority than the, the NHS in terms of the spending pressures? From the outside, it certainly looks to be the, the case. There's a more sophisticated version of the argument that health is so popular that we really should be hypothecating taxes because people really want to see more health spending. Well, yeah, I get that. It clearly is empirically true, but the, the counterpart of that is that if we take health out of the tax system because that's being financed elsewhere, then there's even less reason to support spending on everything else in the health system. You're get not getting what you really want from the rest of the taxes in the system. And if you do think that there are very important things like spending on disadvantaged youth or children or take your pick, that's a real problem, surely. Third issue, very, very quickly, detracts from long-term challenges. There is, no <laughs> um, there is no upper limit to how much people are prepared to spend on health. Look across the Atlantic, over 17% of GDP on health. Does it mean they have a better health system? No. It means that they have a shockingly wasteful health system. And this is true also in the NHS. It's a difficult thing to say, but it is true that we have lots of areas where the spending is not effective. Now, I'm not being naive about this. We all know this. It's, yet it's extremely difficult to actually tackle the waste. And in many cases, the only way that we can actually tackle that waste probably is by spending more so that we can actually really get to the, the root causes, causes of what's going on. But the idea that somehow, next time we have a funding crisis, the thing that we're asking our health service to do is, health service leaders to do, is to make the case for more income rather than actually tackling things like the fact that we're 15 to 20 years behind the financial services sector in use of ICT, the fact that we have impossibly, incredibly inefficient use of the healthcare workforce, the fact that we're still making huge numbers of medical errors which are causing vast amounts of, of unnecessary spending. Unless we actually make sure that we focus on those things, I fear that hypothecation actually reduces the incentives to address these things. That doesn't mean that I don't think there's a case for more money. There absolutely is. It's already been touched on. There is no reason why the UK can't spend more money on health if it wants. Other countries do. That's a choice. Uh, and I think that's just the choice that we should make. Spend more money on health, but spend it through the tax system with proper budgetary control. I'm very sorry for that. <laughs> The Mark did have funds to come, so we let him a bit last year. There is going to be a lot of opportunity to pick up some of these themes later. So finally, we're going to go to our politicians, and I'm going to go to Nick Bowles. Nick, I fear, is so tall that he's uh, he's got all the writing all over him. But anyway, so. well, it's probably an improvement. Thank you very much, Jill. Um, so you can certainly tell that none of that lot have ever stood for election. Um, <laughs> Now, I want to start, uh, really want to do two very simple things, but I want to start by asking everyone to think, including the other panellists who know much more about the subject than I, about other systems where they, being economists, would not define them uh, as hypothecated taxes. But to me, as a politician, it, they look awful like it. So the Netherlands and Germany. How do you pay for your health care in the Netherlands and Germany? It's by paying a charge, you and your employer, on your payroll. Exactly. Now, it works in different ways in both countries, and they have different charges for different things, and sometimes it pays for social care, and sometimes it pays for health care. But at a very basic level, people know that their health care, and in some cases their social care, is paid for by them and their employer through their labour, through their lives. And that proposition is one that people understand at a very basic fundamental level. 
that that's how I get healthcare, that's how I get social care, that's how I ensure that I can live to an old age and make larger and larger demands on the system, knowing that I've paid my bit. And that used to be the message of national insurance in this com country. It used to be, and it's amazing, and any MP from any party will tell you, the number of people who come into your surgery and say, I've paid my stamp all my life. Why am I not getting this? Why am I not getting that? So at a fundamental level, I believe that the social insurance system is onto something. They're onto an idea that people feel it's right. I paid this, I should get this, I paid it all my life, I should get it even after I've stopped work. Now I know that the technicians and the economists can tell me, oh, but that's not a hypothecated tax, that's a social charge. Well, frankly, to me, it doesn't look very different the guarantee is still the same. They still face funding problems. There's still awkward moments where they have to put up the charges in order to make sure that the fund has enough. Those technical problems can be overcome. But at a base level, I think there is a much healthier relationship between people and their work and their health care and their social care. Now I just want to move on to a, a, a separate, more political question. What happens at a major fiscal event in this country. I'll tell you what happens. Every single time, all of the arguments in favour of all of the other spending programmes that have been prepared meticulously by civil servants over the previous nine months that have been supported by deep research by think tanks and institutes and the like, they are all blown out of the water <laughs> by the National Health Service. And let me tell you, the fiscal event that we're about to witness has been completely blown out of the water. In fact, there isn't any water. <laughs> because the National Health Service now needs 20 billion. So imagine that you're a minister responsible for disadvantaged children, and you're trying to make the case for an extra 150 million to be invested in early intervention with mothers who don't speak English as a first language in certain postcodes. And you've prepared your case to the Chancellor, and the Chancellor just says, I'm sorry, it's all going to hell. And that happens every single time. We would have a more mature and a more considered conversation about our public spending priorities if we accepted that we should divide the two. And this is where I differ from Nick. Nick, of course, is a soft hypothecator. <laughs> he's hard on everything else, but he's soft on hypothecation. I have to say, I'm normally a pragmatist, but on this I'm an extremist. <laughs> we need to have total separation of the funding for health and social care. It needs to be totally hypothecated. It must be paid only from a charge, a national health and care insurance charge, on all sources of income, all sources of income, apart from perhaps the state pension. And then we can have a really good conversation about whether defence or education or roads requires uh, the rest of general taxation. It seems to me that that's roughly what happens in Germany and the Netherlands, and those are two countries whose public realm and public health is most admired by their population and by the rest of us. Thank you. And uh, in this phase, we're giving the last word to Ruchinara Ali. Ruchinara. Well, um, I'm, I'm pleased to have the last word, but I'm not sure um, I'm going to be able to add that much more to what my side of the debate have said. Um, what, I, what I want to do is start off by um, saying uh, something uh, specific about hypothecation uh, in relation to the NHS debate. I think it's a cop-out. Uh, and the reason is, 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 you know, much of it has been already said about the um, disadvantages, but there are also ethical considerations. You know, which part of the NHS then, if you take that argument to its logical conclusion, then should, uh, as Dame Minouche has already s suggested uh, in her comments, should 
uh, we hypothecate for specific services within the NHS. Which ones are the more deserving causes that we should be funding within the funding uh, structure of the NHS? Should we be paying for certain kinds of uh, treatment that might be perceived by some people as vanity treatment or unnecessary? Uh, or, you know, the technology is so good that, frankly, people haven't had it so good, so um, they should, you know, but actually there should be limits. Should we be rationing? So, you know, actually it's, it's just not uh, that straightforward uh, to, uh, to, to resort to hypothecation for health. And what about the other deserving causes, whether it's education? And just to correct Nick, it's, it sounds like it's always the case in the Conservative government, but in the Labour government, in the last Labour government, uh, we did manage to put, uh, it, it put investment into education alongside health and other services. Uh, I recognise the context was different, uh, but if there is the political will, we can do more than just fund, uh, just succumb to the pressure for funding the NHS. Uh, but that links to the wider question, of course, which is, uh, are we focusing on the NHS because um, there is a consensus and because it is a national service, as is education, so it's easier to make those arguments. But if you take the NHS out of the equation of taxation and general taxation, you are leaving other services much more vulnerable. You are leaving less popular causes much more vulnerable to attack. Uh, and that's where the political settlement is, is a key one. And that's where um, segmenting all of this uh, because of um, the imperative that has been mentioned around financing health is politically dangerous because once you start doing that, then people break everything down into deserving and undeserving causes that should be funded or not funded. Welfare, not deserving. Uh, health, deserving. Education, deserving. But perhaps not early years education for the poor or sure start because that's for poor people or, or poorer people. Um, so the list goes on. And, and I think um, technical solutions like coming up with hypothecation um, to, to this uh, without being disrespectful to the former permanent secretary of the treasury <laughs> is not going to solve this. Uh, uh, and uh, that's why I'm, I'm skeptical, although I think that it should be uh, one of the finance, financial options that are discussed with the public. Uh, and it would be interesting to see how the public feels about it. Um, the, the related, uh, in terms of the, I have a great deal of sympathy for frustrations for NA, among the NHS professionals uh, about the uh, seesaw nature of investment and disinvestment depending on uh, who's in power. Uh, in the last Labour government you saw uh, rapid investment into healthcare, 6.6% uh, to 8.7% of GDP. Uh, uh, in the last uh, in the first co coalition government, post-2010, you saw the Landley reform, which cost $1.5 described as a costly diversion by the King's Fund. Uh, I can think of other um, less polite ways of describing it, <laughs> but I won't get into that. You've been part of the debate. Uh, NHS professionals and patients have been at the receiving end of completely wasteful, pointless reforms, frankly, where locally we're having to re-establish many of the structures that were effective in order to uh, ensure we have a functional system uh, in, the local, uh, in local communities like mine where we have major health inequalities. Uh, and it's been a diversion from innovation, from thinking about how to be more productive, more effective in the way we, we serve uh, the population, how to do preventative care, how to tackle the challenges faced, uh, facing our society, both in terms of technology as well as the aging population, as well as the need to do, um, do primary care, which is a massive uh, um, ma massive area that successive governments have been weak on investing in. My party in government did put more investment into it, but uh, in my view we could have done more. This government has done very little actually. It's been crisis after crisis and the crisis management approach just won't do. So hypothecation is a cover for political choices that have been made in the last uh, eight years, and you could argue over, um, over the long, pe long term period of the NHS at particular points in time, um, and we need to step up to the challenge now. Uh, and, you know, I'm somebody, as a Labour MP representing Bethnal Green and Bird, the East End of London, which was, you know, an inspiration um, to the founders of the welfare state and the National Health Service, um, recognising the extreme levels of health 
uh, disadvantage and inequality and poverty. Uh, and we still have the highest levels of poverty, child poverty, um, and health inequality in the country, sadly. Um, you know, I'm passionate about defending and supporting the NHS. Uh, but I think that just as what, you, what we do have is this sort of binary conversation um, of it's this or that, and actually what we need um, is much, cl much clearer, much more, um, uh, much more of a sense of leadership, uh, and that requires, and if we can't do it on the NHS, then God help us all, because there's clearly a lot of consensus about protecting and supporting and nurturing the NHS, because it's still better value for money. When we left government, we, it had the highest public satisfaction level uh, in, in memory, living memory. Uh, so there's a lot to fight for. So how do we do that? We do that by building that consensus. Uh, I know in the current polarised uh, nature of our politics, you're probably thinking, is that possible? Well, it is possible. Uh, and one of the things uh, that I wanted to flag up is, um, it's just a letter, but it's a significant letter because we got 94 members of parliament across parties to support, uh, uh, to support an independent parliamentary commission to look at the future of the NHS. Um, over the next 10 to 15, year, 15 years, 20 years, take the long view of financing as well as how we finance it. We did have to mention hypothecation because the Liberals uh, needed to sign up to it. Um, but, you know, and I'm not averse to us exploring the arguments, uh, but there are other options to funding. And taxation has to be at the heart of it, um, and general taxation. And my final point um, to, in relation to all of this, and, and there are a number of other recommendations, but unfortunately the Prime Minister still hasn't um, said yes to this request. Uh, we get a lot of stick for not being able to work across party, come together, think about the national interests. Nick and I both supported this, um, uh, this letter, this campaign, uh, led by Sarah Wollaston and my colleague Liz Kendall and others. Um, and it's falling on deaf ears. Um, the final thing is about influencing public opinion and having the conversation with the public to build consensus around a settlement that... Um, that is based on increasing the tax contribution um, to meet the needs of the National Health Service. That's ultimately what we need. I don't think we can uh, fudge this through a uh, hypothecated tax system that is, as I say, frankly, a cop-out. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so what we're going to do now is give any of you an opportunity to comment or to ask a question, you can ask a question to everybody or to one side or to remember, we're going to try and get through as many comments. Anyone in the uh, spare room, just come in, the overspill room, just come in here and ask your questions. So does anyone want to ask a question? Adela's there with a the mic, I'm here with a mic, so I'm going to go immediately here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Robert Palmer from Tax Justice UK. Um, Dame Shafiq talked about wealth tax as a way of funding the NHS. Given the inequality we have in this country around wealth particularly, do you think that's a good idea? Um, and how would you gain support for that? Okay, how about the double nicks? Wealth tax to support the NHS. Um, no, I'd love to have uh, a wealth tax, but... Um, I've seen no country which has raised serious money from it. Even Socialist France at its peak under the uh, brilliant President Mitterrand, you know, was only getting about 500 million a year. In a sensible world, we tax inheritance, but again, taxpayers are pretty irrational. It's one tax they really hate is inheritance tax. So, look, in principle, yes, um, we need to have a debate about wealth taxes, but I'm terribly pessimistic. Mark, anything, anyone fund health through a wealth tax? Uh, uh, not that I can think of off the top of my head. Obviously, there are countries which have quite big wealth taxes, but they're still very, very small compared with the NHS spend. I don't think it's, uh, it's a very good reason why we should have wealth taxes. We had a report not long ago about social mobility. Mm. Shockingly low, it takes five generations if you're born in the bottom decile to get back up to the average five generations uh, in the UK. Very good reasons why we should have a uh, wealth tax to try and uh, speed up social mobility. That's a way of financing health, it's just peanuts. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I was very reassured hearing about uh, the continuing drivers in the health service. Um, and I, I take the point that when Derek Wanless reported in 2005 or whatever, we haven't changed very much in terms of health service drivers since then. 
And it's particularly interesting actually to hear from Dr. Uh, Gerardo that it hasn't changed in the mid-1950s for that matter, the same sort of things going on. But what we haven't learned, what we haven't heard very much about this evening is that while the health service may not have changed in terms of its behavior, the performance of the economy certainly has. In fact, we've now had 10 years where productivity has scarcely risen at all. Incomes have scarcely risen at all. Uh, someone was brought this at a uh, launch this morning where McKinsey's show this is unprecedented in 150 years. So what we've got is this combination, this infernal combination of the health service continuing to need extra resources and an economy which seems unable over the last decade or so to meet that, that demand. And just the nature of the arithmetic is enormous. I mean, the missing output is now about 350 billion pounds a year, which is enough to run the health service twice and fund uh, half a dozen HS2s if you're so minded. Um, <laughs> and I think that's possibly why there's this difference between is the health service blowing everything out of the water? Well, maybe it is now, because actually the latitude to make decisions within the political system is not as great as it was when productivity is behaving as it was over the previous 140 years. So I think my question, my challenge to the hypothecators would be, isn't the real issue to get to grips with why we're not generating the resources the health service needs and the rest of us need and other public services need? Um, and isn't it really a bit of a kind of sticking plaster I and mean, the distraction that I think a couple of the anti-hypothecators suggest it might be? So first fix the economy, I think, is the bottom line <laughs> there. Nick McPherson. Look, that was um, your job. Um, um, <laughs> um, you know, the, the Treasury was an economics ministry as well as a finance ministry, and um, every, every government I worked for, every two years or so, published a new growth plan or an industrial strategy. And actually, although they always claimed that they were radical and different, they were almost precisely the same. <laughs> um, they were about skills, they were about investment, they were about competition, and so on. And... Every single one of them had virtually no effect. In fact, actually, if you take Joe's point, they actually had a negative effect, although actually I think the drivers of the slowdown are different from that. So look, I totally agree. We really have to get a grip on this problem, but I am very skeptical about government's ability to deliver on it. So look, let, let's try and improve growth, but in the meanwhile, the real preference of the British people and the politicians they elect is to borrow and consume. Um, we, we cannot go on like this. Um, so um, we've got to find some way of getting some more tax in. So think soft hypothecation. So Minosh, any thoughts about growth as a strategy? Anything we should be doing? Are we missing out? I mean, <laughs> you know, I, there have been reams of <coughs> thoughts on the productivity puzzle in the UK mm. and why it has stagnated. And I, I don't want to summarize all of that work here. It's very complicated and I would have to agree with Nick that the NHS funding crisis is now and the productivity solutions are in the future and we need to do both but it won't solve the immediate funding issues. So Claire, Mark gave quite a long list of potential things you could be doing actually for the NHS to help itself. I think of sort well, of you know, uh, things that it could be doing to not just make this giant. And I, I disagree with Mark, though I defer to his um, clearly expertise. And I don't think the NHS is inefficient. I think it's actually a very efficient service. If you were to say to me, where can efficiencies be made? And I sort of said it at the beginning and got a little bit of a laugh. But during the Blair government, when we did get an injection of resource, it mainly went into building new hospitals and employing new hospital specialists. And we now have a specialist led national hospital service if we really and truly want to, to spend less and deliver more i'm absolutely honest and absolutely serious about this ladies and gentlemen we need to invest in more gps and we need more gps spending longer with their patients and their communities there is unbelievable evidence that shows the more GPs you have per head of population, the cheaper, the safer the health system is. And that even includes your hospital service. So, and yet what we're doing, as you probably notice, is we're, 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 <coughs> GPs are now becoming a scarce resource, almost like the, the sort of uh, 
you know, endangered species. Mm -hmm. And yet we're continuing to, to give to the public the idea that the best thing you can possibly do when you have a pain in your, your left toe is to go and see a left toe specialist. Yeah. When actually yeah. it isn't. The best thing you can do when you have a pain in your left toe is do what my patients did this afternoon, which is come and see me. So there are ways, but there is no political will to it, because, of course, you as the members of the public, the moment you or your families or your children become ill, instantly want to see a specialist. And, and bless us, the, the, our, our colleagues and our, our folk from, from European countries want to see specialists for all sorts of things. So that is the way of squeezing more money. And, and actually, if there was a... If, the only thing that comes out of this crisis with, it, with health money is that we get more GPs, then I think that will, that will sustain us for another 50 years. OK, we'll hold that thought about weaning people off their addiction to hospitals. Uh, yes. Uh, John Hewitt-Jones from UA Money, Institution and Investor. Um, I just wondered if any of the panel ha ha had thoughts on how the private sector might view a hypothecated tax and specifically how UK health insurers might view a hypothecated tax from the NHS. Mark, do you have any view on how health insurers in other countries regard hypothecated taxes? Well, the trouble is, as you've heard already, we're talking about so many different sorts yeah. of hypothecation from the very <coughs> soft sorts uh, to the, the absolute kind of private health insurance model. And obviously, yes, there's a great deal of interest from private health insurers in private health insurance models, <laughs> unsurprisingly. Um, <laughs> they, they make a lot of money uh, in some cases from, from this system. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that that's particularly relevant. If you set up a system that involves the people who are <laughs> administrating the health system being employed by private health insurers, then that's where you have your, your health care costs or you have them within the public sector and they're paid for by the NHS. One way or the other, you have a lot of admin. Evidence suggests the more that you go down the private health insurance routes, the greater are your admin costs. And that's something I just want to emphasize uh, because I, I think we've heard from the other side that, um, yes, the Germans and the Dutch are happier with their health systems than the British. I think that's okay. probably true. They spend 2.5-3% of GDP more, more exactly. on their health system. Mm -hmm. exactly. We've heard that maybe the, the NHS isn't inefficient. Well, actually, I think that's broadly true as well. I think, basically, we're averagely efficient. We spend middling, yeah. low level of uh, GDP on health. We have middling to low outcomes internationally or, um, on, uh, from the, the NHS, it means that we've got about average efficiency. But Mark, Mark don't, yeah. you, don't, you, don't you see the, the, my puzzlement, which is that I agree with you that the Dutch and the Germans spend more. I want us to spend more. I want us to be happy to spend more. They are happy to spend more. Is it, is it, is it, is it just because they're German and Dutch? <laughs> or is it because they know how it's paid for? They see it on their pay slip. It's absolutely transparent to them. I'm, I just find it amazing to think that that has no connection with the willingness to pay more, whereas we all know that they the also general taxes, they it all goes central. into one central pot, and yes, they tell you that they're going to spend they it on this, that and the other, they never do. <laughs> um, and I'm one of the ones who never does, so, you know. So, so the national insurance is a payroll tax, an awful lot like empl taxing employers in the Dutch and German systems. There is a problem with payroll tax in the sense that it only falls on employers and is paid by people who are employed. And I think Ironically, when Beveridge thought of the welfare state, he thought of it as a social insurance model, exactly as yeah. you've described it, where people pay in and get benefits out depending on how much they paid in. But over the years, it has evolved into a different model. Ironically, I actually think that the current model is better suited to the future economy, as more and more workers do not have a single employer and are not attached to a single employer for a very long time. And I think from the private sector's point of view, as the employment relationship changes, I think linking your health revenue to where you work is actually, for the future economy, a bad idea. Okay. Uh, Edward True, uh, former civil servant and uh, now officially part of the demographic pressure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like me. <laughs> Um, look, I'm not there yeah, yet. Well, uh, there. A, a great debate. I'm sorry the two Nicks are on the wrong side of the argument. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought they made some very good points. Nick, Nick um, talked about the loss of trust, and, and sorry, the other, 
the other Nick talked about the healthier relationship in, in some foreign countries. And it seems to me that Nick McPherson's um, answer to the loss of trust was to bank it, as it were, and say, well, we've lost trust, so let's do something to get money in a different way. And it seems to me, particularly at the moment, there is a real problem with loss of trust. And yeah. this is Rishonara's point about the, the cop-out. And actually, the real problem is the lack of trust between the taxpayers and, and government. And, and the question, therefore, is if that, if, if Nick, is, Nick McPherson is right, which I think he is, how do you actually go back, or you should go back, and how do you do this? Go back to the core point of restoring trust. So the government says, we are going to raise tax by general taxation, and we are going to use it in this way. It's good. We are, I think, as Rishanara says, we are copping out from what is a much more fundamental problem about democracy, parliamentary democracy at the moment. Mm. You think it's going to take a long time to solve the productivity puzzle? <laughs> 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 trust in politicians really is going to take a while. <laughs> I think trust Edward, Edward. just emerged on the Ipsos Mori index, index of issues of concern for the first time, which they really changed. Roshanara? Well, ju just on that point, I think um, it, it is... Uh, it, I, think, I think Nick is feeling, uh, being, being rather... Um, uh, have, has a rather dim view of how we might be able to persuade the public to take a different view. I mean, your, the starting point is the public is supportive of the NHS, which is a very different place to where other services are. The public is not in that place on welfare. The public is not on that place on a whole range of other issues. So if you can't win that argument, then we shouldn't be in politics, frankly, Nick. Um, so I, th I think that's my first point. The second She's in is opposition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't be in government if you can't win that um, Good <laughs> our turn. Um, so, so then the next, next thing is how can we persuade? And there is some evidence and some good examples of where um, some of the work around behavioural science is showing that um, in the work that the behavioral insights team has done um, is that that if you uh, if people for instance on tax you know what generates good behavior uh, do people pay their bills if they think others are playing by the rules um, their tax bill um, how should the government when it's seeking or the tax um, receiver hmrc how should it engage with the public should they be sending them really strict punitive um, uh, bills or should they be having a conversation with them to say this is why we do this this is why we pay you tax uh, you, your how we use your tax this is why it, why it's important that you pay the bill and everyone else <coughs> is paying it by the way so there are lots of interesting ways in which we can try and win the argument with the public but yeah, it's not happened that. and i'm afraid uh, government departments are hardly have been hardly imaginative in the way that they engage with the public. And then, therefore, my, uh, what I have is a call on Whitehall to start engaging with the public um, and having those conversations with the public. And, and, you know, the cynicism about experts, and I love experts. Uh, today, when I got here, I thought I had expert envy. Um, <laughs> seriously, I know, I know you're unpopular, but we're even more unpopular. <laughs> so, but I really did, because, because expertise matters. But that expertise has to be out there, uh, and people have to learn where and be uh, engaged in that conversation. And that knowledge has to be shared so that they can see the case and you can win, win the argument. And so I call on civil servants to start to join the army of persuasion, uh, along with politicians, to win the argument about general taxation. OK, Nick. Um, it's great pity that Edward Troop only just stood down as chairman of Fermented Revenue and Customs. Otherwise, he could have taken away <laughs> your recommendation to be more sensitive and implemented it. Well, the results hey, are better, the, actually. The, the, the results and the payback uh, for, for no, one study are that, better. The, the, you, get, you, get, you, you do manage to get better uh, results from the public no, when no, they're I agree, not getting no, these strict, punitive, hostile I, letters from no, the HMRC. I, I certainly endorse that. Um, but the point I wanted to make which is about the trust point, and this, this again plays into the soft hypothecation argument, is that my guess is that over the next 10 to 15 years, spending on health and social care, and just to be clear, in my world, I'm hypothecating for health and social care, mm. will go up more than probably the aggregate level of taxation needs necessarily to go up by. Um, there are other sort of demographic pressures, if you read Robert's report, on things like education in a downwards direction. So, um, and if we could get rid of the triple lock, we'd be in an even better place. But, but my point is that actually, it's relatively easy over this period to link increases in tax to increases in spending. You know, you will actually be able to demonstrate 
that the money is going to the NHS. So um, I think this is a golden opportunity. Okay, got a, got a question here, and then I've got some people very keen to come in down here. Uh, Jerry Holtham from Cardiff Met University. Um, the situation is, as you say, going to get a lot worse over 20 years. We've currently got over 70s, about 20% of the population. They're going to be nearly a third by mid-2040s. So if you think it's bad now, it's going to get worse. And given the slow growth of, um, of productivity, it's very unlikely that British wages are going to grow fast enough for, for taxes on income to, to meet the solution. Now, the difference now, though, between, between now and the 45 period, when the, when the, uh, when the original um, national insurance was started, was then they had no money and immediate demands. Now we've got demands that are in the future. We can see they're out there. So the obvious thing to do is to have a funded system. Whack the taxes in now, hypothecate them by all means, pay them into a fund, uh, because you're gonna raise more tax than you need to spend immediately. The investment from the fund will then help you to meet the, to meet the, the requirements further out. You know, as Piketty has shown, it's, you could, the odds are very much that the returns to investment globally are going to be much faster than the growth of British wages. So why wouldn't you have a funded scheme and uh, hypothecate the taxes to a funded scheme? Can I just respond to that very yeah. briefly? The, you spend most of your health care spend is in your last year of life, and you only die once. So whether your last year of life is one year, two year, 99, 100, that's when you, you're most... So th th I think we've got to move away from this argument that the rising cost in healthcare is due to the rising demographics. It's not as simple as that. And, and actually, we've also got to get out of this nihilistic belief, as I keep saying, that costs will increase. We can only live a certain amount of time. I know people are saying we're going to all live to 100. So even with advanced, more advanced technology, it's not going to increase the life expectancy. And what we've got to move away from is, is this nihilistic belief that we're seeing rising costs in healthcare because of rising technology. I keep saying this, if we put the money into the right place, invest in community and primary care, we will start to reduce health costs. The reason we've got increasing health costs is we've, we've got a national hospital service. Now I keep saying this in these very clever audience, and I've se I go repeatedly to lots and lots of meetings, lots of debates, where we keep talking about rising health costs as if they are an inevitability. They are not. Just to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Minouche, funded scheme. The amount you would need to fund a scheme would be so huge. I don't know where you would start, to be honest. I mean, the idea that you could bank it now and tap into it later, I mean, mm -hmm. to fund a scheme that's going to generate 150 billion mm -hmm. of income? One is talking of trillions and trillions. I just don't, I, I think it's too late to have a funded scheme, I guess. And, and I think the demographic, it's just too late demographically to have a funded scheme would be my assessment. Okay, Chris. Uh, uh, Chris Giles from the Financial Times. I'm gonna quickly quote from the Prime Minister's article in the Sunday Telegraph uh, this week where she said that if you support her checkers proposal, that will end the vast payments to the EU budget so that we can fund our long-term <laughs> plan for the NHS. Sorry, so I missed the last bit. So, so she said that if you support her proposal, that will end the vast payments to the EU budget so that we can fund her long-term plan for the NHS. Now, I'm quoting the Prime Minister not because... Uh, well, I want to well, 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 Brexit well, debate, now. but because she suddenly changed in this article her, what she says about the Brexit dividend, because before it was going to partly fund uh, the NHS, and now it's going to entirely fund the NHS. Now, anyone who knows maths knows <laughs> this is complete nonsense uh, because the maximum you can get back is, let's say, we have no effect on tax revenues, it's about 7 billion, and she's committed about 25 billion a year to the NHS. Now, so the question for Manoush is that the Prime Minister seems <laughs> uh, to be willing to deceive us all and to try and deceive us all. And so, and, and this, this comment, this change in her stance, was picked up by nobody. No one cared, everyone worried about other bits in this article. Fortunately, it's behind a paywall, so those of us who don't subscribe <laughs> to the Telegraph couldn't read it. Exactly. But, but absolutely no one picked up this sort of completely absurd statement that the Prime Minister uh, made in her article. And so I wondered whether you, for Manoush, the question is whether you, we should change Lincoln's 
famous <laughs> statement in, in, in that you, maybe you can fool all the people all the time <laughs> if people want to be fooled, and maybe on the NHS we want to be fooled, and so hypothecation is a good idea. <laughs> I thought we were going to ask Manoush to defend the Brexit dividend, which would be more interesting. Anyway, Manoush, do you want to comment on... <coughs> oh, she's just borrowing a page out of Boris Johnson's book, isn't she? It's that, sort of, it's that sort of politics. But it's, it's exactly that sort of politics that has got us into the trust mess that we're in. Okay, okay, Nick, and, Nick and I are in that space, of course. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to have to just, uh, just wrap it up with a couple of very quick-fire questions. I'm going to ask you to just pass the mic between you, is there anyone behind us? So I'm going to give it to my colleague Gemma, and then she'll go to Julian, and then we'll leave there, and then we'll just get the panel to give some final thoughts, and then we'll have a vote. Uh, Gemma Tetlow, Chief Economist at the Institute for Government. Um, I just wanted to, I guess, probe or maybe point out, as we're running out of time, the inconsistencies and the visions of hypothecation presented by the pro side. I mean, much like Brexit, you all seem to be presenting different visions of what hypothecation would be that solve different problems and sound inconsistent with one another, and I wondered if I'm right about that. Okay, you can vote for any Well spotted. <laughs> 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 Yeah, we need a referendum. Great. Um, Julian McRae, um, as of tonight, we'll be ex of the Institute for Government, uh, cool. now of King's College okay. London, um, but also um, formerly of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, uh, as has been mentioned a few times. I thought I would end up being a heretic, as I was at the IFS, where I'm an IFS person who believes in hypothecation around the NHS. <laughs> but I was so relieved to find that what I might call politician Nick was espousing the form of hypothecation that I actually think is the right way to go at this. And official Nick was giving me a sort of mechanism in this uh, IFS, I like to call it an OBR for spend, uh, that would actually put some pressure on reforming inside the budget. But question I have, because I think this is not about the NHS. This is about the other parts of government that constantly get raided to fund the NHS. And if you look at the performance track of the Institute producers, there's some heinous examples of areas which are being massively underfunded at the moment. So question to the um, opposing hypothecation, how do you save the rest of government spend from this monster that is inside our budget that keeps eating things? And then actually question to those are in favour of hypothecation, why do you want anything more than hospitals inside this? Because that's the thing that's eating all the resource. I wouldn't put the GPs in this ring fence because they'll just get eaten by the hospitals and leave them outside. Yeah, I can get rid of hospitals. Edward Jones, GK Strategy. I wanted to ask a quick question, not about the, the if, but the how, to both the, the hypothecators and the anti-hypothecationists. Um, Nick set out his view that it should be a, some sort of insurance scheme. If you had to have a hypothecated tax, whether you believe in it or not, would it be a expanding um, or extending uh, national insurance? Would it be an income tax? What would be your ideal means to, to doing so, whether you believe it's the right thing to do or, or, or not? So, we'll go down the line with final comments. We'll go in sort of reverse order from the way people uh, spoke at the start. Just pick up those questions and your last big comment before we go to a vote. So let's start with Roshanara. Great. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think many of the arguments that have been made about hypo hypothecation, uh, I remain completely unconvinced, even more unconvinced than when I walked in through the room <laughs> where originally I signed up to a letter where uh, the exploration of hypothecation was one of the things that we thought the Commission should be doing uh, because of the very problematic nature of, of, of that, um, that kind of taxation. Uh, I think it should come from uh, general taxation, so I'm not going to answer your question, <laughs> like a typical politician, um, <laughs> on how to, how to do it, how to do hypothecation. Uh, uh, well, unfortunately, I don't have that luxury with Brexit. Um, <laughs> we are going to have to engage with how to leave, uh, even though uh, I would rather we didn't. Um, in, in terms of uh, where I would like us to focus um, our resources, in terms of thinking about how do we cost effectively um, run the NHS, I just want to you know, endorse what Dr. Uh, Claire um, Gerardo was saying about prevention and primary care and social care. Uh, and those are political choices, whether it's Labour choices or Conservative choices, and they have been the Cinderella areas of 
the NHS. Now, I'm not going to apologise for the fact that the Labour government invested in infrastructure. It needed to, because hospitals <coughs> like my local hospital, the Royal London, and a number of others were falling apart, just like schools were. So we're not going to apologise for that. But, but Dr Clare is absolutely right that the emphasis needs to be on primary care uh, and other preventative work and GPs. Does anyone manage to get a uh, doctor's appointment for uh, less than two weeks? I mean, I give up usually when I try and get an appointment. So she's with absolutely, me if you absolutely want. right. <laughs> You're absolutely right about that. Um, and the cost effective nature of how we do healthcare is where we need to focus our priority. Uh, because of the reform process that Lansley introduced, that took up a lot of the energy, energy and uh, efforts of the NHS as well as cost. We need to refocus on that if we're serious about how <coughs> the NHS is run, not just about how it's taxed and funded. <coughs> Nick Volz. Okay, so I would pay for it through a payroll charge, uh, which would be uh, settled on earned income, unearned income, uh, pension income acceptance, so above a threshold, which was effectively the state pension. Um, and uh, it would be through, through that national insurance scheme that would be renamed National Health and Care Insurance. And just hospitals or Your, No, 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 I've put the whole, the whole bank sheet, including social care, in there. Okay, Mark. Uh, I think that idea of using payroll taxes extended to broader levels of income has been tried. It hasn't worked. What's happened is that the government's essentially had to come in and pay for those people who are, say, unemployed or disabled because otherwise there's a gap in the And you're just ending up by talking about general taxation. This is the softest form of hypothecation. It's a, it's a little myth that's out there, that somehow the money that you're contributing to is actually going to something when it's not. It's just in a big pot and then it's being allocated. However, it does build up some sort of uh, dynamic that there is money there and that these countries that go down that route are in fact the most hospital-centric countries <laughs> that actually exist around in all our health services. If you want to have an efficient health service, one that makes decisions on where you're going to get most bang for the money, avoid hypothecation, make your decisions on where you actually get best value for money. Declare. Yeah. Well, it's a uh, ramp for hospitals. Yeah, well, I was going to start to say something. Different. Isn't it amazing that Bevan, all those years ago, set up a system that is still doing what it says on the tin? I mean, I'm always amazed that... Uh, and he actually said, by the way, that he wanted an average system. He didn't want an excellent system. And if you go and look at some of his quotes, and so I'm struck that we have an average system. <laughs> Uh, which is what he wanted. And actually, working in the NHS, despite uh, its problems, is probably one of the an most enormous honours that somebody could ever <coughs> have. And being able to do the job that I do, and many people, 1.2 million people do, is quite amazing. So all I will say to end all of this is I, the plea to the politicians is, please get us out of this mess that is Brexit. <laughs> And please make sure that in 50 years' time, or when I really seriously will need the health service, that it's there for when I need it. So that's what I'm going to okay, say. Okay, final very quick words from Manoush and then Nick. Me. Um, you know, I think this is an area where there is actually a cross-party consensus um, around the need for higher levels of taxation to fund the NHS. And it is a rare opportunity where trust might be rebuilt with the public <laughs> that politicians do have an honest conversation with the public to say, everybody knows we need to spend more money, everybody knows we need to raise tax to do it, we all agree this is the only path, and we agree this is the most efficient way to tax it. Uh, and if you're going to do the right thing, do the right thing rather than hypothecate uh, and do the economically rational thing. And I do think there's something about communicating with the public more clearly. I mean, you know, councils, local councils have now developed these little, you know, sort of, re when you get your council yeah, yeah. bill, you get this little thing that says it's this much is being spent on rubbish collection and this much is being spent on local services and that kind of thing. Um, why not show the public exactly? We're going to, this is how much taxes are going up and this is the exact increment in the pie that's going to go to the NHS and make it very well. explicit. You don't need to hypothecate because hypothecation is arbitrarily suboptimal, but but at least demonstrate clearly that that is how the spending is going to happen. Um, so I I think this isn't a moment to do the right thing. The analysis is clear, the politics is clear, and uh, and why not why not restore a little bit of trust 
in politics and public life at this moment. And if we can't do it on the NHS, we're doomed. <coughs> okay, Nick. Um, I think Manoush makes very good points, but the fact <laughs> is we've tried funding we've tried it as honesty, a general it taxation. <laughs> we send Edward Troop's outfit, you just, thanks to David Gork's excellent reforms, used to send a thing every year saying where your money, mm -hmm. what your money was spent on. Does it make any difference? <laughs> no, you just chuck it in a bin. So we need to try something different. I am going for the mildest, most incremental approach. It could evolve into the all singing, all dancing bells approach, but you know, I, 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 I'm the cautious sort of person and I think we need to tread carefully. But we do need to pay more tax. Um, it needs to fund the whole, I, I don't buy this separated just to hospitals, it needs to include GP services, the whole damn uh, shooting match, including social care. Um, that's the only way to get money to those uh, organisations. And my final point is, this tax needs to be broadly based. Um, I actually, I have no problems with um, raising national insurance through multiple um, employments. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be multiply employed now and believe me I seem to pay an awful lot of national insurance so it can be done and it needs to be based on all income there should be no reliefs and old people should pay it young people should pay it there should be no exclusions that is efficient tax policy okay thank you very much so we so Anita is going to take the stage and summarize some key points but before that Anita, voice to go we're just going to ask you to vote, because it's a debate, and we have a vote at the end. So we've got uh, Tim, we're going to ask Nick to count this side, uh, and send Adela in there, uh, and then we'll try and add the things up while Anita's speaking. So, if you think it is time for a hypothecated tax to fund the NHS, which means you're supporting those people, would you like to put your hand up? Yeah. Rough numbers will do. Yeah, We're assuming you're voting. Yeah, you're allowed to change sides. <laughs> 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 okay. You know we're behind. So you know we're behind. <laughs> if it's overwhelming, we'll just go straight to the summing up. And if you think that this side was right and it's not time for a hypothecated tax. <laughs> I think you guys are fired. I fear. It's the I think it's the government. <laughs> what did you expect? <laughs> <laughs> Let me just show how much touch we are. Anyway, to finalise, Anita uh, Charlesworth, Chief Economist at the Health Foundation. Anita. It did seem such a good idea to, to sum up, didn't it, a while ago? Um, actually, uh, it's a, a fantastic discussion, and, and we have had to make, managed to make um, talking about tax fun. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> we, we, Don't we, get out much. Yeah, no, it's quite. <laughs> Switch Baby says quite a lot about us. Um, the other thing which is very noticeable is actually, you know, we're all very pro tax, um, and, and actually. Um, I say that in a joking way, but actually underlying this is a really set of really fundamental and quite core uh, questions that we debated here about the relationship between the citizen and the state, the extent to which we see a connection between the payment of our taxes and the services we get, the extent to which we see the people who make decisions um, about that operating in our interest. And I think very importantly, and a point that um, <coughs> underpins some of what um, Nick Mack was saying, the extent to which as well we feel that decisions that we're making today take account as well of the interests of people who are to come. <coughs> and the big worry about some of the issues around consumption and borrowing. So these are some really fundamental <coughs> questions that go to the heart of the role of government. And I guess what strikes me in that is it, it is a set of issues and in the end I voted but I found it very difficult to to, uh, 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 to vote because I found both sides presented some really compelling arguments actually <clears throat> um, about some of those questions that we ought to really uh, think about. Um, trust and transparency came up over and over again mm -hmm. and our ability to have a quality uh, uh, and a real debate around that and I guess I was feeling quite swayed by Manoush and then I mean the point about the, how disingenuous the discussion is around the Brexit dividend and actually how deeply undermining 
that sort of uh, position is to our ability to have the proper conversation that we really need to have if we're to make good term, long term decisions as a society. The scale of the challenge that we face around healthcare and its enduring nature, it is such a big part of our public spending now. It is such an important service. That means that it's really important in its own right. I think this question about, about the impact that then decisions about uh, the NHS have on wider public spending and how we can get to a better place ar around the tra choices and trade-offs between health care, different parts of the health care budget, but then health care and other public services. This is incredibly important. It's incredibly important overall, but actually if you care about health in my narrow frame, it's also really, really important because all those other things in in impact on health. And how we do this in the economic context, you know, and, and Joe's point about just the, 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 the position we've been in for the last nine years, that actually we are nine years into growth and, you know, I worked for a man who believed that boom and bust might have ended. Um, <clears throat> history has taught us that it doesn't end. We're in a bad position for a downturn. We've got massive risks and we've got a structural problem uh, in terms of productivity with self-inflicted enormous uh, uh, short-term uh, risks uh, and how we are going to make good decisions in, in that context uh, seems to me incredibly challenging. So we, we had a lot of fun today, tonight I think, but I, you know, I probably don't get out enough, but <laughs> I had a lot of fun, but actually we covered some quite deep and profound questions which however we debate those, whether hypothecation is the right way to debate this, they are the real issues that, that we have to address. So thank you everybody for making me think really hard about those, but leaving me with quite a dilemma where I don't know what I think, and that's rare for me. <laughs> <laughs>